12.4. So we know we've talked about in class how these temperatures on Earth have been uh, correlated with the amount of carbon dioxide in our air. And so CO2 is closely related to the temperature. So we think of CO2 in the atmosphere, just think that degrees Celsius. Okay, they're they're linked because carbon dioxide is that very important greenhouse gas and we've been placing more in the atmosphere due to burning our fossil fuels. And as a lucky for us, um, we can look back thousands of years of Earth's history by looking at ice cores. It's pretty cool stuff. So ice has been falling uh, in Antarctica for a long time since it's been there at the, the the bottom of the earth there at the South Pole. And then every um, winter, there's a new layer of snow. So you can go back just like on a tree. You can look at count layers and look back how far uh, that core has been around. So, and when that ice forms, um, you know, fr freezes and forms that layer, a tiny, tiny bubble of gas is trapped in it. And inside that bubble is gas. And that can be tested. Uh, and in this way, the concentration of CO2 can be measured. And it's very, it's very complicated and fastidious. Remember I told you Antarctica is not cold enough for the technology they need to use. And that's Antarctica is not cold enough. So, when they drill, they take a big core, it drills into the ice, and they pull it out. They'll get a big core like this, and then they'll look, there's all these lines there from all these layers from year after year after year. Like I said, you can just read it like the a tree ring. You know, a tree grows a little bit more every year. Um, at least dicots do, or um, um, yeah, dicots. And palm trees, you won't see anything like this, but something like a maple tree, you will. And you can just count all these rings to see how old the tree is because it'll grow and then go dormant. Grow in the summer, go dormant, and it forms these rings. So these ice cores are too cold or need to be frozen even more, so they'll have to go in special freezers or freeze rooms. Down there in Antarctica, they need to cool it down even more just to keep that to preserve this um, ice core intact. They want to keep it, anything from disturbing it. Then, very carefully, they'll take their instruments and be able to release those gas bubbles into a, something called a gas chromatograph that can measure uh, the ratios of different products, um, isotopes of, of uh, oxygen, and this thing called deuterium, which is a type of hydrogen. Um, and yeah, so ratios of hydrogen, oh man, this is very laggy, hi, I'm sorry, this pen is not performing very well, and well, I guess what I'll show you with this, so it says, um, deuterium, so what that is, is H plus. And there's less of that H plus deuterium when it's cold. So they can measure the temperature by how much deuterium there is. And we can re repeat this in modern day uh, when ice freezes and to, to get a, uh, a reference point. And then go back and look at these ice cores, how much uh, deuterium basically you get compared to oxygen. Oxygen is usually its normal isotope is uh, O16, and then other isotopes of oxygen are 18. So it look at the ratio between oxygen and deuterium, and remember, like I said, more deuterium, it's going to be colder. So let me write that again so it's clear. So more deuterium. Uh, the warmer it is. So,
So it'll just measure how much deuterium, and basically it's like a thermometer. That's why you see it's a proxy, yeah, proxy. So they're not directly uh, measuring the the, high, the temperature, but you can use the deuterium uh, to oxygen ratios to figure that out. So if you look at this, here's the CO2, which we can test from those uh, bubbles uh, compared to deuterium levels or ratios. And you can see when the temperature goes down, um, so does that, I'm sorry, when the when the CO2 goes down, so does the temperature. Temperature rises, so is the CO2. And you just see very similar um, overall trends in these two graphs. And I think this is a, it's a powerful way. That, as far as Earth is concerned, the main, one of the main gases that controls our atmosphere, the temperature of our atmosphere, is CO2. Because why else would it be so closely related to temperature if it wasn't, if it was due to some other gases, which change over time as well. But no other gas can show that kind of close correlation between um, temperature and its concentration. So other factors, um, other factors other than greenhouse gases affect global mean temperatures, which you know, is average. Um, and this is Milankovitch. Um, cycles and sunspots. Oops, sunspots. So these cycles are the ch uh, changes in the tilt of the Earth. So as we said earlier, I think I mentioned before the, the seasons, right? Created by this is the Earth. It's on a tilt. Here's the sun. And in the winter, we're tilted away, and that sun, sunlight doesn't hit the northern hemisphere directly. It's indirect, so there's just less energy, so it's cooler. And say in Australia, it's more direct, it's a lot hotter. And you'll see around the equator here, it usually gets fairly direct sunlight, so it's warming up. But the change in the tilt of the Earth can really affect um, our temperature in a big way. So the tilt can change it, and sometimes our orbit varies. It wobbles a little bit going around the sun. So obviously, if we're a lot closer to the sun, that's going to heat us up. Right now, we're a little bit further away during the winter a little bit closer to the summer, but that difference isn't enough to affect climate in any meaningful way, or uh, temperature, that is. It's this, um, the tilt is more important and the fact that we have the greenhouse gases. Um, in the sunspots, temporary increases in the radiation coming from the sun, and uh, uh, they can, science can measure um, the influence, it's hard for me to see what's behind there. Uh, so let me check on my other paper. Okay, so that's, um, scientists can measure the influence. These are other explanations, right? Like, is it really CO2 or is it these Milankovitch cycles? Nations. Um, is it the, uh, the uh, orbit of the Earth around us, and are we getting closer? And scientists look at those, they can't find any evidence that those uh, Milankovitch cycles uh, or sunspots are significant enough to be um, responsible for that change in climate, so they can be ruled out. Remember, scientists are very skeptical about their ideas. It takes a long time for them to accept um, the initial data. So scientists first noticed the CO2 relationship back in the 50s, took 20 years to really study it and rule out other factors. And then finally in the 80s, the consensus came together. So scientists have been studying these other explanations. They've been, they, all, they want to prove themselves wrong. That's what the beauty is of science. And if you can't do that and everybody's trying to prove you wrong, then you have to finally admit that this is really what's happening here. So higher temperatures, of course, increase evaporation of the water. It's just hotter. You know that hot water evaporates more. So we're going to get more, a lot more moisture in the air, and that's going to cause more rainfall. Of course, the main thing we worry about with the rainfall is flooding. Uh, very dangerous, the most deadly. Um, can I go draw skull and crossbones right here? Very, this is skull and crossbones I'm drawing, in case you're wondering. Very deadly. 
uh, one of the, the most deadliest natural disaster events that the humans face and have faced throughout our time here on Earth. Um, so these tropical storms and hurricanes feed off the heat and the moisture um, that they find in the ocean. Moisture, really laggy, my apologies. This is moisture. Oh, that's even worse. Uh, Plays like California, we're already pretty dry, and we have been getting drier, and that's one of the predictions of global warming. In places that have a lot of rainfall, we'll likely get even more rainfall. A place like England is a good example of that. A lot more rain is falling in England in the last 20 years. And even a single degree change in oval averages really have a profound changes in our climate. And a study just came out, I was reading it yesterday, our national parks increased by 5 degrees uh, in the last 100 years versus about 1 degree for the rest of the United States. And that's because a lot of parks are in Alaska, which are far north. So places far north or high elevation um, face an even higher um, increase in temperature. Instead of that 1 degree, it's going to be up to 15 degrees in some these are high elevations. So here I want you to take a look at this, look carefully. These are consequences um, that we're going to see because of global warming. Okay, so water stress, you're not being able to have enough water and decreased availability. Uh, ecosystems, we have bleaching that's happening um, and that's going to really put a lot of pressure on our terrestrial and all, all ecosystems are going to have to change, um, adapt to that. Uh, our food supply systems are going to be affected. So farming, uh, industrialized, but then subsistence, farm, subsistence farmers, which would be if you had to grow everything you need to eat in your garden, I guarantee you, you wouldn't be able to do it. Well, I not guarantee, but uh, I would be very skeptical any of us could actually do that. Uh, so we rely on our system, which is going to be under major stress. Coastline, so what's left of the wetlands most likely gone because of all that uh, increased wave action and more diarrhea and different um, infectious diseases that usually occur in tropical areas because of the temperature needed to, uh, for the mosquitoes that transmit those um, diseases to, to reproduce. So that's what the disease vectors are. So the main vector we're concerned about is the deadliest animal on earth, the mosquito, besides humans. This would definitely be the deadliest. So if you look at here, these are um, areas that are going to be changing. So increased hurricanes. If, you remember, if you've been reading the news, there have been a couple of hurricanes hit Mexico that have caused some major damage. And we've heard Hurricane Michael just hit. There was another one in North Carolina. Uh, so increase. Um, action. Um, there might not be more hurricanes, but whatever hurricanes there are, are going to release more moisture. So there's going to be more, not that move, that's M O R E, more flooding. Okay, so we're already seeing that. And of course, Southeast Asia increased hurricanes. Um, Almost a third of the population of the world lives where I'm, where I'm circling right here, China and India. You see India also has some major issues with um, drought. And um, so extreme weather and surf, Bangladesh, very low-lying country. Um, same thing along a lot of these, uh, about like the Yangtze River. In China, a low-lying area is going to be have major, major impacts. So you're looking at a global calamity. Right now, you're already seeing massive amounts of people in the Horn of Africa and uh, Southern Africa coming into Europe. And that is creating a huge refugee crisis. Um, and that's all going to get worse. Um, and it, we're isolated over here for the most part. But we know the world is connected now. What affects the world over in Africa and Asia affects us. 
And but getting back to that correlation, you know, it used to be a low about 160 parts per million, and oh, the fluctuation between 160 and then uh, I think it's uh, 300. Let me just let me check that real quick. Uh, yes, so around 160 to 300 parts per million. You guys have to go slower or something. Okay. And our current parts per million is around 405. And that's, as you can see, a lot more than that current, than that traditional, you know, between 160 and 300. And uh, this is incorrect. I want you to block this off. I was getting my um, my deeper history wrong. Uh, instead, 800,000 times, 800,000 years ago, there was a pre-human pre It's a long word and this thing is so laggy. Uh, I'll have to tell you, but anyway, uh, Heidelbergensis is before uh, humans have been around 150, maybe 200,000 years, so this is before humans, but not before our upright walking apes like us, uh, something called Homo erectus, uh, Homo ergaster, um, also are pre-humans, basically, and they were around, but definitely not since the time that you know, humans have been around have these CO2 levels been so high. And starting in the early 1800s, Coal started to be using as the main energy source uh, that fueled that industrial revolution. And uh, later on, we added natural gas and oil. Coal was easier to handle in the mines, so that's why it was first. Gas they just left off, and nobody knew what to do with oil for a while. Until around, around 1900, and then oil started to be used more. And the big increase really occurred after 1850. I'm sorry, everybody. 1850 is what I'm trying to write here. But it's just not cooperating. Maybe lighter? Anyway, 1850. And they looked like the scientists had looked at every other possible explanation, trying to prove themselves wrong. And CO2 is the only, uh, has the only firm relationship with the increase in our global average temperature. Uh, and this is an example. A lot of global warming denials say, oh, it's the volcanoes releasing CO2, not us, and the sulfur dioxide. Well, funny thing is we can measure how much the volcanoes are releasing, and we can measure how much we are releasing. And this is way bigger than uh, what we are releasing. is, a, is much more uh, than what's coming out of... Ah, uh, volcanoes. Thank you.